Good morning, everyone. A lot of you are asking about a little video on the evolution of democracy, the expansion of democracy in the early republic. Um, so hopefully your studying is going well. We're in the, the crunch time here, and I want to just talk about a topic that you know may or may be the question. We don't know what the question is going to be, and that is kind of the you know hanging over us. But this is something that if the question does come from time period three, four, or perhaps even five, this uh, lecture will be um, helpful uh, to you. So the first question I put up there was um, some kind of question that deals with the rise of the common man, the growth of democracy, and the young republic. And you see the three different questions, variants of this. So you want to make sure that you're not thrown off if the question is not exactly how you studied and prepared, but one of those rule of thumb we've talked about is you can always answer what you don't know with what you know, right? And, and play to your strengths. Um, just write the best essay you possibly can. Um, following the guidelines, the templates, what they're looking at in the rubric. Uh, so again, reviewing that rubric will be absolutely so important, but don't be so strict with it that you just, you know, you want to look at that and that's all you're looking at. You got to be able to think and write and use those documents because those documents are going to be so important to get a high score. So just look at the first question here and use that kind of as a, a template moving forward. Evaluate the extent to which the expansion of democracy fostered political change. And they're going to give you the years, always that. So we're looking at this question, the extent you have to have somewhere in your thesis that it was a great, massive change, right? Some qualifier that does hit the extent. If you don't have that qualifier in your thesis, you might not get that thesis point. And more times than not, you're not going to. And then you have to answer the other part of the question, how did the expansion of democracy foster political change? So how did more and more people getting uh, the right to vote or having a say in the political process, how did that foster political change? Okay. But they might ask the question in terms of social change, right? They might have the understanding that democracy expands, is taking place, but how did that change the social aspects of things? Or how did that change the economic aspects of that? And a related question, uh, specifically the first part of this lecture would be, um, looking at time period three and the effects of the American Revolution, right? Winning independence from Great Britain. How did that change things? How did that, what did that look like? So a question that could be asked is some form of evaluate the extent of change that was caused by the American Revolution. And there's lots of different changes and you could definitely have a whole body paragraph on political and they would have a document or two more than likely from political changes that are taking place. Okay, so when we're thinking about democracy, and I wish we really could have covered the whole course and seen how democracy has evolved and changed from the founding of the Republic all the way up until, you know, 2020. But we're going to focus really on this part is everything up until uh, the Civil War. And what did that look like? And I think to get a better understanding of where you want to come from this is looking at the biggest picture possible of change and the idea that we take so much for granted today in terms of what is politics and everyone who is you know 18 or older can vote um, that's not how it was in the past and we need to look at how that change and evolve but also going back even farther that a world where we can't even vote at all anyone can vote Right. And that's the American experiment. That's the experiment in Republican government, which is a key component of the Enlightenment, that we don't have to have a king. The king and his advisors make all the calls, call the shots. What does that look like when other people are involved in the political process? So what we see from independence all the way through the Civil War is who is involved in the political process. Right. That's a big component. And tied with it, with that is what will the role of government be? And if we have a federal government, which is firmly established in the Constitution, but that wasn't even you know, immediately following the revolution, what will the role of the government be? And how much power will it have? 
right? Who's involved in this process? What will that look like? Is it just men of property? Okay. That's how it started. Okay. And you go to the end of time period five and it's men, 21 or older, regardless of property. And regardless if their ethnic background was European or African in descent, right? So by the time we get to the 15th Amendment. So massive change is taking place. And what will power look like, right? What will power look like? And we see here George Washington. And think about power that he is a president, right? He's not a king, right? And what type of power should any one person have? And those were, you know, big questions of the Enlightenment and really a big part of this experiment, right? And so if we're looking at the first party system, right, and we have really the debate taking place in the 1790s, right? George Washington is president. He's understood to be that great civic virtue man man who has shown previously that he can handle leadership, but what will that really entail? Okay. But within that mix, we have Hamilton and Jefferson, right? And we've talked about them quite a bit. And it's their really vision, just not a vision of America, but their visions can only be accomplished through power, right? And, and the role of the central government. So if you look at Hamilton and what he is um, trying to get the central government to do, and you know, as one of the writers of the Constitution was on the ground floor of that, is to create an economic and military powerhouse with leadership centralized in what will be Washington, D.C., to guide and steer the country. Okay, Jefferson, coming from a different point of view, is the belief that the central power federal government central power should be quite limited, that we should be something different from a king, right? And so in terms of how their vision is, it's all about power and, and people's role in that, which becomes interesting to self, right? Because Hamilton, um, he has, he wants limited democracy. He wants democracy. He believes the people should have um, a say, but not in the same say that we would think of it today, right? And in terms of using the government, having a strong military, and having an elite, all right, um, should guide the country. Where Jefferson, and he's looking at what, what is the voice of the people, and what do the people want? Now, one of Jefferson's assumptions is the people want what he wants, which is a limited government, which liberty your individual liberty and your choice to pursue your own happiness, right? That's that's a centerpiece. Okay. And so, you know, liberty is more important than wealth. Liberty is more important than having a strong army and navy and things like that. And of course, the idea of an independent farmer and a farmer, you need land. And so that plays a big role in this as well. All right. So their disagreements are creating the first party system. All right. And Though the Constitution kind of tried to rein in democracy, democracy is a hard thing uh, to rein in. And we're not going to go through all of this, but these are some of the you know key components of the 1790s, which created the first political parties and the disagreements over, say, the National Bank. And the National Bank's about power, right? It's about who's in charge of this power, okay, and who will be really playing a major role with this okay in the role of the people we've kind of already talked about this um and then the french revolution is going to play into um the idea of liberty on a, on a global scale but also america's role in the world okay so to recap a little bit on the beginnings of these this transition here is do you have people who want a dynamic central power in this case, would be Hamilton, and and those who are suspicious of power, right? Regardless of who is in charge of the power or has the power in their hands, that you should even be suspicious of people of your own party who have power. What do they really want from that, right? And this whole um, 
limited power, uh, comes out of the revolution, that Whig idea. This is the first Whigs, not the Whig party that will come in the 1840s. But this idea that you need to be suspicious of the king. You need to be suspicious of any person who wants power with that. And that kind of is the establishment that takes us into the election of 1800, which is really important, and Jefferson's victory over Adams, and this kind of ushering in of a Jeffersonian vision, which is really in place for almost 30 years. But then, um, as everything is changing, uh, economically, politically, socially, we have the second party system, and we're going to focus on Andrew Jackson and Henry Clay. They're the two people, the two proper noun uh, facts that you would most need to use um, if a question comes up dealing with this, right? So even if it's a social change question, uh, you can still bring in Clay or Jackson, and we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, so Henry Clay, Kentucky, just real quick. Um, if you're talking about the 1820s through the 1840s, he's promoting the American system, right? And this is like Hamilton. So even though Clay and Jackson initially are both Democratic Republicans, right? They're all, they're both followers of Jefferson in their own way. Um, Clay is evolving and looking at the centralized national government should be promoting um, the economic well-being of the country as best as it possibly can. Slow and steady growth, right? And have a, another national bank, a second national bank because the first one went away, right? And that's 1816, having protective tariffs, protecting American businesses from foreign competition because we are, you know, 50 years behind the, the British in terms of the Industrial Revolution. And there's all kinds of series of controversy and conflict that comes out of that. And there's all the internal improvements of trying to tie together the whole country and what that's going to look like. And so... Is a touch upon the 1824 election because this election and the one that follows really breaks up the old system, right? The, the first party system, technically, it pretty much ends, <clears throat> excuse me, with the death of the Federalist Party coming after the War of 1812. But here you have all Democratic Republicans, John Quincy Adams, Jackson, Clay, Crawford. And what will the new country look like moving forward, right? When when the old system has broken down. And we know this is a controversial election because Jackson, who gets the most uh, of popular votes, as you can see here, 43%, and gets 38% of the Electoral College vote, which is the one that really matters, but he doesn't have, you know, enough to really win. So John Quincy Adams wins because Jackson won a plurality of the popular vote, but not a majority. And you have a majority over 50% electoral college. And so the top three move on to the House of Representatives. And in that, Henry Clay, who at the time was Speaker of the House, has tremendous power. And on the very first ballot, um, John Quincy Adams is elected president. And the Jacksonians um, or outraged in the whole corrupt bargain accusations. But what Clay and Adams had in common politically was the idea of a centralized national government having an agenda that is set by those who know what they need to do and you know expand the power of the government. That is not what most people in America wanted. And you can see from this painting that the men here, they're not elites. Um, Henry Clay would perhaps be very um, accepted and could mingle quite well here. It could be a more frontier atmosphere. John Quincy Adams, would have a little more tougher time with that. But this is what is becoming more and more of the norm, right? And so this idea of the rise of the common man. And this reflects the cultural changes that are taking place uh, in the 1820s and 1830s and in the 1840s and 50s, right? Because by the mid-1820s, property qualifications for voting have been removed. And that's a key fact that you want to touch upon, that no longer do you have to 
prove that you own so much land or pay a large amount of taxes, which is always tied to the land, to be your voice being heard. That um, the average person will be involved in the political process if they choose to be so. Okay. And this goes back to the idea that, you know, no one had the right to vote. No one had the privilege of voting under monarchy. Right. And so the United States is going to be different. And it was different. It was developing as different. And the first group um, to fight to win the voice would be um, adult white males. And as more and more people have the say and have the vote and promote it, democracy itself becomes more and more respectable, right? Democracy, the D word, was not respected um, in the 1750s and 1760s, 1780s, right? It seemed as dangerous. Uh, Men who perhaps were not cultured, did not have an education, did not have wealth. Why in the world would you have those people um, have a say in who's the leader, what the country should be doing, and those things? But as more people had that, as more um, human respected. And then politically, it becomes the ideal for many American voters that um, in the 1820s and 1830s, it starts to change after that, but in the 1820s and 1830s, to have a college degree almost in the eyes of many people made you unacceptable for political leadership because you're an elite, you're a privileged elite, and you should have no say because you don't represent, you don't represent the more people. So having a humble birth, right? Being authentic, right? Became more and more of a important thing, right? And this is a whole deeper conversation we could have, but this idea of authenticity to be authentic, um, that was not um, a quality that anyone in the colonial period would have Um, necessarily seen as always a positive to be authentic, that you had a a public persona, you had a a private persona, and you wore two different masks, if you will. Um, Benjamin Franklin has a whole big part of this in his autobiography uh, tied to that. But the idea about being authentic, right, um, that you saw someone just not as honest, but they did not you know, try to protect what they looked like in the terms of their past, right? They are proud of their uh, father was poor or anything like that, right? And so this is tied to a lot of the frontier life. As more and more Americans just represented or lived in the frontier, lived in the wilderness, their sheer numbers became important. So this idea of rugged individualism as a motto, a mantra, and there are plenty of men who fit that bill like Davy Crockett and Sam Bowie and Thomas Hart Benton and many others of this time. And we want, we'll really want to look at the key person with this, and that's President Jackson, right? Jackson just really embodies to many Americans um, what, themselves, right? Themselves as success, themselves as leader. And he is the first president who has lived the majority of his life um, west of the Appalachian Mountains, right? And he has little former former education. Uh, He's a self-made man, tell himself to be a lawyer, uh, plantation owner, uh, military leader, right? And, of course, he makes his claim to fame in his late 40s in the War of 1812. And a lot of what Jackson's persona was and who he was, um, he really did believe that he represented a certain type of person. Okay. He viewed himself as the people's direct representative representative. Um, and he did not see himself as a nonpartisan leader. I think that's really important about the expansion of power that he wasn't necessarily preaching unity. He said that he represented the common man. Um, the farmer, the mechanic, uh, the man on the frontier, and that he was a protector of them. They're the ones who voted for him, and and that was his uh, way of contributing to them, protecting them against people he called the elite, the rich, the moneyed powers, those Yankee New England uh, shopkeepers, right? Those 
um, people, factory owners, the, the first factory owners and things like this, the people who ran and profited from banks. And his view, a lot of its perception, right? His view of what the Constitution and what our country was and the union was, was for the average person, not a plaything for the moneyed powers. And so because he believed he was, um, the election of 1824 was stolen from him, he creates a political party known as the Democratic Party. All right, so the emphasis is on democracy. And he couldn't have done that without Martin Van Buren. But he is creating a system, a political power, right, that's based on these ideas. The Constitution and the Union being key, but promoting the interests of the common man. Not necessarily the entire country, but his own faction. Okay, And that really is a huge uh, change that takes place. And at first, um, the former Democratic Republicans who did not like Jackson, and they called them themselves many different things, national Republicans, um, before they really settle on the idea of Whigs. But it is in 1840 that's the big, big change. Um, it takes a little time before the enemies of Jackson to say, okay, we can't beat him the old way, right? Um, we can't have just the best person be elected by the people. The people aren't going to pick necessarily the best person by their resume, right? Um, they're going to have to pick. They're going to pick someone who they feel fits this popular mold of the common man, right? And so the Whigs, as they're now calling themselves, right, um, throw out their William Henry Harrison in 1840, and he really runs a Jacksonian-style campaign. So the Whigs are taking what defeated them and all those different tricks, having campaign songs, right, um, having campaign songs, having rallies, having posters, getting people to go out and vote, Right. This is the hard cider and log cabin campaign of 1840. Proper noun fact that can be very useful in showing that the Whigs are taking this idea of popular mass movements, you know, depicting William Henry Harrison as a man who is comfortable in a log cabin and drinks hard cider. OK, it didn't matter that Harrison wasn't like that. That had not been his life. Um, necessarily, though he did live in the frontier as territorial governor of the Northwest Territory and of Ohio and places like that. That was not who he was, but in popular um, you know, political campaigns, um, he is definitely, they're depicting him as a common man. Okay, And this is a good thing. And of course, this old political card, little toy here, you would you know, pull a lever and it looked like, oh, Van Buren is the aristocrat, right? Van Buren is that um, guy who likes nice suits and drinks French champagne and things like that. And kind of a, implying that he is not quite as American as William Henry Harrison. And you have this whole festival atmosphere of politics, right? Even in 1800, Jefferson versus Adams, you never would have seen anything like this. Parades, bands, getting people out to vote. Um, this is really representative of the second party system, which comes about in the 1840s and will pretty much continue through the rest of the 19th century, even after the Civil War. OK, and so William Henry Harrison wins, uh, defeats Martin Van Buren. So here's the Whigs using the playbook of the Democrats, using populism, using this popular ideas of the common man uh, to win an election. So let's take a look at this real quick. And here are some facts. Not that you would write any of these facts in an essay. You wouldn't. But to give yourself an idea of the transformation. That you could at least say that the amount of people voting increases greatly. OK, and how many states are allowing um, voters to choose their presidential electors? So. 
you have this huge increase in the number of people who can uh, choose electoral um, from the electoral college, right? But also the number of people who are voting and the eligible voters who are voting. So even in 1824, right, we I mean, talk about low voter turnout, okay? And then you see a, a doubling of voter turnout in the two. Um, so these three are all times that Jackson uh, ran for president. He loses in the first one and then wins in 28 and wins in 32. And then even in 36, um, but by 1840, when you have the Whigs finally organizing themselves as a national party and using the same, you know, tricks and playbooks of the Democrats, you're having huge voter turnout, just massive amount of people. So within 16 years, you have 356,000 voters jumping over 2.4 million voters just in 16 years. And a lot of that is not just property um, rules being eliminated, though that does play um, still play some role. It's just people being engaged um, in the political process, having a candidate they want to vote for, right? Um, having people elect their leaders who will have power over their everyday lives and are becoming more and more comfortable with that that they want something from the federal government. Okay. So we have this expansion of men in the political process. And as that expands, you know, and this is a time period by the 1840s, you have the first call for women. Um, should they have some say in the political process? So the whole cultural identity is, is changing in many ways. But at the same time, you have this narrow view of who can vote and other voting in the political process and political parties. At the same time, you have lots of disruptors. Okay. And some people have been asking about the complexity of history. So, and what that, what would that paragraph look like? What would that last point look like if you have time to write basically a conclusion paragraph? We don't really want to think of it as a conclusion, but it's there, that last paragraph, that complexity of history. So if your whole essay was talking about the expansion of the common man, expansion of democracy, and everything tied politically, having a paragraph that talked about, say, manifest destiny and westward expansion and how westward expansion was a product of more average people voting because they wanted access to land they believe was not being used, at least was not you know, available to them. But now it is, so they're going to vote to vote for someone who says, yeah, you know, California way out there, that should be part of the United States. I, I believe that Americans should go there and have an opportunity to uh, pursue their happiness in a place called California or a place called Oregon. And so by bringing in a totally different area, say manifest destiny, because you would know that's taking place at the same time you have this expansion of democracy, even though the question itself does not ask about manifest destiny, bringing that in and talking about how that is a part of this greater story, that's the complexity of history, right? That's kind of going outside the box of the question for one paragraph, okay? And talking about that and linking that back to your thesis, that's how you're going to your complexity question. So we have manifest destiny and all the change of that. We also could talk about the Industrial Revolution, Right. Because at the exact same time, people are having more say in their government. Well, their world is changing dramatically, at least in a lot of people's world. OK. And so you could talk about how the Industrial Revolution um, started to change and affect people's lives and their voting habits changed because of that. Now, we're not going to go through all of this um, necessarily. This isn't the PowerPoints that I've shared in the past as you've looked at this, but I want to talk about um, at least one thing here beyond the main idea of you have these disruptors, right? And so you have more and more people being affected by things like the twin revolutions and how having better communication and faster transportation, that's one, making manifest destiny a reality, right? You're overthrowing the tyranny of distance and 
Political parties can use the new communication and transportation revolutions to promote their views, their ideas, right? And especially once the telegraph um, is invented and begins to be uh, adopted for use, the political parties by the 1850s are all using the telegraph extensively. And this is having a massive effect on American society, just not socially and uh, economically, but politically as well. So bringing that in is a way of showing complexity of history. Okay? If your strong suit is more the religious aspects that are changing, and we have the Second Great Awakening, which is happening at the exact same time we have the expansion of democracy. All right? And I'm just going to touch upon a couple of things in this one right here. I think we should focus on the expansion of democracy, the spirit of self-improvement, and individualism. People taking control of their individual lives, in this case it could be spiritually, but that's tied in this idea that people now have more say over their political lives. And that goes together. All right. And this is all wrapped into the Industrial Revolution, upward mobility, and expansion west. Right, Isolated communities wanted social interaction. They wanted uh, a direct link to salvation. And so itinerant preachers... Uh, these outdoor spiritual revivals, all of this takes place. And one of the big changes in America's religion was democracy is changing American religion just as it's changing the American political system. Because you can see here, um, more and more Americans um, are taking a direct control over their churches, who their ministers should be, um, how they should conduct themselves, and there's also this call for reform, right? It's just not spiritual reform internally, but think about someone like Charles Finney, the great evangelist of the Second Great Awakening, talking about going after those twin sins of alcohol and slavery, right? And it's just not that you should organize your faith that way. You, as a people, now have the vote to go and change the country to perhaps meet your religious standards, right? And also there's all these new American religions. What's more democratic than that is the establishment of a new religion that you think fits your lifestyle the best, right? And that's, um, that's very disruptive in terms of the old traditional ways and what that's going to look like. It's so rich, right? There's so much going on right now in, in America in terms of this um, antebellum period before the Civil War. And it's just not Manifest Destiny. It's definitely that. It's just not the Industrial Revolution, huge impact, and Great Awakening. But tied to this is people's perceptions in terms of the peculiar institution, right? In terms of slavery. And we've talked a lot about earlier in the year this mindset change, this generational mindset change from someone like Thomas Jefferson to John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. And each of these men being representative of a greater um, belief in terms of what slavery um, was. And so you start to have this challenging of slavery during the 1770s and 1780s, this enlightenment that's challenging the status quo, that Thomas Jefferson, son of a slaveholder, sees something wrong, inherently wrong within the world he was born in. Talk about using reason and self-reflection and then the political process to perhaps change that, right? And that is where most Americans thought we were going. The North had already uh, you know, abolished slavery after the revolution. Talk of going back to that. Changes um, in the United States after the revolution is the Northern states um, immediately or gradually abolish the institution of slavery. And most enlightened people believe that's how it would continue. Of course, the cotton gin, the Industrial Revolution changes all that and kind of terminates that. But even though slavery was viewed as a necessary evil, that is changing. The Industrial Revolution is changing. Manifest destiny, which is pushing us westward for new territorial lands, new lands for cotton. Right, And that is becoming the biggest, biggest disruptor. And now the Second Great Awakening, to counter that, you have this growing abolitionist movement. 
right? And William Lloyd Garrison and the Liberator representing that, that slavery is evil, okay? Not a necessary evil, purely evil, and needs to be, you know, eradicated. But at the same time, as the abolitionists are becoming more verbal, more powerful, more in your face, um, Southerners who are seeing great wealth being created because of the grow growing of cotton um, begin to rationalize, justify their system, their peculiar institution as a positive good. All right. And this is creating friction within the rise of the common man. So you can, the more you understand or are comfortable with this knowledge, you can start to apply it to other things. So the idea of complexity of history is tying it to these events. Right. That might be a little bit outside the box of the initial question. And then you can wrap up um, in Unit 5, time period 5, the election of 1860, which we have before this the fracturing of the Whig Party, and then we have the fracturing of the Democratic Party over the issue of slavery. So even though um, voting has been expanded, and both sides are using the power of newspapers and the telegraph and the transportation system of railroads by the by 1860. Um, it doesn't mean we all have the same vision of where we're going. And with Manifest Destiny and the territorial question of slavery um, is breaking the country apart. And so when Lincoln wins in 1860, the South secedes, right? And they're seceding primarily over the fact that they want slavery to continue and to expand. And even though it was protected under the Constitution, they don't see a future um, going down the road because political power has grown so intensely that they see that um, the North could eventually somehow destroy slavery or destroy enough about slavery to make it not profitable, that that's the great danger and they want to remove themselves um, from the union. But they're doing it again politically, politically um, when it comes down to it. So uh, the bottom line is we have this um, big change just taking place. As more and more people have the vote, what do they want to do with the vote, right? Um, what should the role of the central government be? And the role of the central government has grown and grown and grown slowly, but pretty steadily throughout our, our history. All right, so hopefully that helped and in many ways. Now, um, welcome any feedback you have and we can um, add more to if we need to. Good luck.